It's indeed such an honor to be in your company. And I hope that what I have to say will resonate with you and inspire further conversation. And the words on the left of my screen are Gyanunga Hagen, which is the Mohawk word for Mohawk people, um, and Shnabe, another indigenous group in Canada, and Haudenosaunee. These are some of the nations whose lands upon which um, we live. So since the mid 1990s, policymakers in Europe and North America have become more attuned to the important role that social and solidarity economies play in supporting communities to adapt to uncertainty, vulnerability, and crisis. And especially after the 2008 financial crisis, when states began to implement austerity programs, governments realizing how social and solidarity economies filled the gap in social provisioning began to build an expanded role for them in their policy agendas. The embrace by Western governments and international aid agencies has been instrumental to the surge of interest in and support for SSE institutions in places like Jamaica, where the state has declared its commitment to driving the growth of the sector. As the ILO observes, many policymakers see SSEs with their human-centered approaches as well positioned to help countries meet the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And of course, I haven't been here for your other days in this conference, but I know that you've probably um, been speaking a lot about social and solidarity economies, so I won't do too much there. Uh, the Jamaican state, oh, sorry, my fingers cut. Oh, sorry, hold on a second. Things are moving without me touching them. Okay. Well, let me move my hand from here. So the Jamaican state and the private sector have enthusiastically embraced the SSE policy agenda in a bid to increase the country's social infrastructure investments after years of neglect. Supporting the growth of social enterprise organizations that use business strategies to meet environmental and social goals has been a cornerstone of this emerging strategy with organizations as diverse as the OECD, the World Bank, USAID, USAID, and the EU emerging as key advocates of this global policy shift. But what does it really mean to support SSEs, and in particular, the social mission that so many view as crucial to their capacity to respond to many of the complex challenges challenges facing the global economy. Answering this question, I believe, requires a deep knowledge of the social relationships that have historically sustained the social and solidarity economy over long periods of time, the institutional practices that govern how they function, and importantly, the rationalities that guide them. So in this talk, I shall examine <clears throat> current attempts to support SSEs in Jamaica, and in particular, the emerging policy agenda to promote social enterprise. I have three objectives in this talk. One, to examine the popularity of the social enterprise model of development in Jamaica and the assumptions this emerging policy agenda makes about the social relationships that sustain social and solidarity economies. Two, to draw attention to the anti-colonial roots of the institutions, social relationships and practices upon which Jamaica's social and solidarity economy is founded. And three, to demonstrate how current social enterprise, the current, how the current social enterprise model depoliticizes and potentially threatens the sustainability of these social institutions and practices. I shall argue that Jamaica's social enterprise model of development is founded upon market logics that are contrary to many of the principles that have historically sustained its social and solidarity economy. These principles have their roots in the experiences of plantation slavery, indentureship, and the struggles to build new types of communities in the aftermath of these systems of unfreedom. 
Thus, efforts to make cooperatives, mutual aid societies, self-help groups, not-for-profit groups more responsive to market signals have the potential to destabilize the very foundations and radical traditions upon which many institutions and organizations in Jamaica's social and solidarity economy are based. So that's my argument and this is my objective. So as many of you are aware, the social and solidarity economy refers to a myriad of institutions guided by principles and practices that value cooperation, reciprocity, redistribution, solidarity, ethics, and democratic self-management. It includes cooperatives, mutual benefit societies, not-for-profits, foundations, and social enterprises. Social and solidarity economies exist at every level within the global economic system, influencing all manner of economic exchange, including finance, production, distribution, and governance. Now, while SSEs have existed since time immemorial, their value to the functioning of the global economy and their capacity to offer an alternative vision for the social organization of life on the planet has only recently since the mid 1990s, come to the attention of policymakers and scholars in the West. This is not to say that there was no recognition of the value of SSEs before the 1990s, but rather as Priscilla Ferrier reminds us that business scholars and Western policymakers have only just begin, begun to recognize their value. Indeed, as early as the 1980s, feminist scholars documented the important role that the social and solidarity economy played in the social reproduction of societies subject to austerity policies, the ones that followed the 1970s debt crisis in the global south. With their attentive to practices of everyday life, they documented how communities collectively organized to address eroding levels of access to employment, health, food and, and, housing, and housing, emphasizing the importance of these practices to the health and welfare of not only households and communities, but also of the environments within which they lived. And I don't know if you're all too young, your students, Christabel, but you should know who is on the left. But if you don't, feminists like Schwash de Mitte, writing on dignity and daily bread and her, her famous book, Common Fate, Common Bond, or Lourdes Beneria, the woman on the bottom, who asked us to think about economics as if all people mattered, they repeatedly insisted greater recognition and support needed to be given to these economies of care because they were so crucial to sustaining life in the context of free market fundamentalism. The writings of J.K. Gibson Graham, I don't know how many of you might know these authors, are illustrative of the way that feminists have recently sought to bring attention to the value that marginalized and often invisible non-market and unpaid economic activities bring to market economies. They argue that by restricting our definition of the economy to the market economy, we obscure the vastly different ways that exchange is negotiated, the different ways that labor is performed, and importantly, the diverse ways in which we could produce a kinder, gentler, and just world. Their concept of community economies captured here by the iceberg model on the right um, was defined, defined economies as the ethical negotiation of our interdependence with each other and the environment, putting that center stage. And that definition of community economies really tried to capture the vast range of exchange relationships that policymakers now identify as key strengths of the SSEs. So if you look at the um, iceberg picture, what is what they argued was, you know, we may recognize the market economy at the top of the iceberg, but below it is a whole lot of other types of economies, the ones that we now recognize as social and solidarity economies that support it. And this work has been so very influential to the way that many feminists think and many feminists have written, but missing in the diverse economies literature is an explicit recognition of the place of racial dispossession 
racial memory, and freedom struggles in the formation and sustainability of these non-market forms. What is missing is an attention to what Sylvia Winter calls that area of experience called the new world, or alternatively, the experience of new world coloniality from which Caribbean radical traditions emerged. Without an account of the place of racial capitalist dispossession and struggle in the creation of social and solidarity economies, frameworks like the diverse economies framework appear depoliticized and unmoored from the collective consciousness and shared sense of obligation that continues to be crucial building blocks in the different modes of survival and ways of being human that sustain SSEs. The current embrace of social enterprise in particular similarly threatens to erase the instrumental role of radical consciousness and struggle in the activities of SSEs. International development organizations like the EU, the World Bank, and so on, see social enterprise as a win-win market solution for service delivery to the poor. They see social enterprise as the solution to the lack of capacity and fiscal resources that have prevented governments from providing services to the poor. And they see social enterprise as an alternative solution then to the reluctance of private firms to assume the high risks entailed in servicing the poorest. Or in the words of authors of the authors of One World Bank document, those populations that constitute the last mile. Now that word, the last mile, that term is a term used in logistics that alludes to the difficulties in maintaining efficiencies in the last leg of a supply chain. And this is the way in which they have spoken about the reluctance on the part of the private sector to look after the needs or to service the needs of the poorest. Now, while policymakers acknowledge the vital role SSEs play in the ability to, of communities to absorb, accommodate, adapt, and transform or resist deteriorating social and environmental crises, they tend to do so within the vocabulary of the market economy, emphasizing the qualities that prevent SSEs from making a more sustained social contribution rather than the obstacles that prevent states and public institutions from doing more. It is becoming all too common for policy documents to portray SSE organizations as restricted in their capacity to effect change because they lack financial resources or experience difficulties in gaining access to capital. These documents rarely acknowledge the broader context within which SSEs function, and in particular, the retreat of the state from providing for social need. Rather than exploring ways for government and private institutions to assist SSEs in expanding their social mission, the policy literature has tended to focus instead on delineating the market conditions needed for SSEs to thrive. Now, drawing on common sense discourses that question the dependability and credibility of the funds that social and solidarity economies generate, the emerging social enterprise model aims to capitalize upon discourses of obligation, justice, and collective care, the moral texts of social and solidarity economies, in order to make mutual aid organizations much more responsive to market logics such as efficiency profitability and return on revenue. So what I want to do now, having sort of talked about my position in relation to the general literature, is to turn to Jamaica. And I want to illustrate some of the ways in which the turn towards social enterprise obscures the racial histories, radical traditions, and importantly, the relations of trust and obligation that have been crucial to the success of a good many SSEs on the island. I ask what can be learned from the historic practices of Caribbean populations to establish lives and livelihoods within economic landscapes of restricted possibility during uh, and after slavery? And I think this is an important question because it gets to the heart of what 
holds a good many SSEs in the Caribbean and in Jamaica together. Now, up until 1838, throughout the British Caribbean, most racialized workers were dispossessed of their capacity to sell their own labor. Their labor power was owned, commodified, and consumed by others through the legal institution of chattel slavery and state-sanctioned violence. Enslaved people in Jamaica could neither own land nor property because they were property. And because of the peculiarity of chattel, they were dispossessed of ownership in themselves and their children who were born the property of those that enslaved them too. In such environments of unfreedom, it's really difficult to envisage how cultures of reciprocity, sharing or trust could have emerged. Africans transported to the region rarely shared the same ethnicity, let alone language, and over time, uh, of others with them, and over time had experiences that were vastly different from the Creole born population, those that were born and raised on the island. That's what the term Creole means. But a strong sense of community did emerge from the plantation experience one that emerged from the spaces where people could congregate outside of the watchful eye of plantation owners and overseers. This was the space of the plot, the only place in the plantation industrial complex where enslaved people could reclaim their personhood. The plot, sometimes also called the provision ground, was land set aside on the plantation for enslaved people to grow the food they ate. While slave owners devised provision grounds in order to save money, these spaces unknowingly provided enslaved people with access to time and space that was both within the order dictated by the plantation and yet detached from it. And because of this contradiction, provision grounds and gardens allowed slaves to develop an extensive and even impressive range of independent production and marketing activities that became instrumental to their ability to survive the brutality of the system, to develop social and political solidarities, and for a minuscule minority to save enough money to buy their freedom. And that was really a minuscule minority. As Sylvia Winter observes, the plot was the slave's area of escape from the plantation. It was an area of experience which reinvented and therefore perpetuated an alternative worldview, an alternative consciousness to that of the plantation. This worldview was marginalized by the plantation, but never destroyed. Provision grounds enabled on free peoples of African descent to reaffirm themselves because as Wint Winter explains, the ideology of the provision ground and the culture based on it rehumanized the object property relationship created by plantation ideology. The liberatory and community building space enabled by the plot is captured also by Michel Rolf Trouillot when he states, and I love this quote, so I will quote it in full. Time used on the provision grounds was also slave controlled time to a large extent. It was time to create culture, knowingly or unknowingly. It was time to develop new practices of labor cooperation, reminiscent of, yet different from African modes of work. Time to talk across the fences to a passing neighbor or to cross the fences themselves and fish in the adjacent rivers. Time to mark the work tempo with old songs, to learn rhythm while working, and to enjoy both the rhythm and the work. Time to create new songs when the old ones faded away. Time to take care of the needs of the family, to meet a mate, to teach children how to climb a tree. Time indeed to develop mode of thought and codes of behavior that were to survive plantation slavery itself. And this is a very important quote for me because it's capturing something of the essence of what we now today call the SSEs in the context of the Caribbean, the cultures of cooperation and reciprocity that emerged from the provision ground. These cultures also provided the foundation for the social economies created after emancipation 
and the formal end of slavery, which was in 1838 in the British colonies, but not in Bentership, for which many people from the Indian subcontinent were still caught in that particular relationship. Emancipation presented a new set of challenges for people who had formerly been chapel, as the ties that they had once had to the provision grounds were now broken. And the colonial government in a desperate bid to protect large plantation agriculture sought to discourage small scale peasant farming through discriminatory laws that made it very costly to acquire land. Rich planters also made ownership near impossible by charging extortionate rents to those who sought to become independent farmers on their own terms. So partnerships between local black congregations, religious ones, deacons and ministers, and a variety of white evangelical, mission, evangelical missionaries circumvented this obstacle through the creation of free villages. These were tracts of land that were purchased by Baptist and Quaker intermediaries that were divided into parcels and subsequently sold to newly freed farmers or settlers as they were called, who often pooled their financial resources in order to purchase these subdivided small freeholds. In 1842, approximately 150 to 200 free villages had been established on approximately 100,000 acres of land. And that facilitated the construction of approximately 3,000 villages. By 1845, approximately a third of the formerly enslaved population had relocated to these new settlements. Now the concept of the free village is perhaps one of the earliest examples of a Jamaican post-emancipation solidarity economy whose spiritual groundings and commitment to building family and community was closely tied to the freedom struggles and aspirations of newly freed peoples. Now, while many of the forms of self-help and community practices found in free villages had their roots in the social relationships that had developed in the provision grounds, they later became crucial to the success of Jamaica's cooperative movement. Practices like jointly purchasing land and reselling it to members or pledging pooled land as security for each other or exchanging labor through practices such as practices were, which hold names such as morning sport or lend day. And you can imagine what these forms of cooperation were or work partnerships or throwing in a hand in a rotating savings and credit association, these were enacted by people who were committed to the tacit rules that governed these collective exchanges, rules that emphasized trust, responsibility, and, and accountability to the collective. Sorry, I've got a stuck um, thingy here. While these cooperative practices were crucial to the creation of an independent rural peasantry, their collective efforts were never integrated into the economy in ways that might have supported industrial scale agricultural production. As Elsie LeFranc Riley observed back in 1978, any interest in agricultural cooperatives held by the colonial government seemed motivated by their desire to divest themselves of responsibility for the extreme lack of available credit for small farmers or to reduce requests for grants or aid. She argues that the interests of the colonial government and large landowning elites to keep small farmers small explains why despite the popularity of formal cooperative models built on the principles established by the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers, which was an early British consumer cooperative of weavers, that these were never really able to expand in ways that could challenge the structural inequalities that have continued to define the post-plantation era even today. Sorry, I'm really having a slide to start moving. One second. Okay, I think I may have to touch it each time. So today, um, over 400 years since emancipation, the importance of the Caribbean radical tradition to the success of the island's social and solidarity economy continues 
in the activities of organizations like LifeYard, which I want to introduce you to. This is a group that was um, established in 2014 by a group of young Rastafarians whose social mission has been to introduce young people in one of Kingston's poorest neighborhoods to their culture through art, agriculture, and education. Life Yard draws heavily on black radical traditions, including the philosophies of Garveyism. And I'm sorry if you don't know about Garveyism, it will take me too much time to explain it, but it was um, one of the foundational black radical traditions from which cooperative um, cooperation and solidarity emerged. And the practices of collective dialogue, respect for nature and natural living, and the rejection of Western epistemes that guide Rastafarianism. So if you look at the um, slide that I have here, these are very three of the key concepts that um, shape the lives and the way in which Rastafarians live their lives. A rejection of Western ways of knowing, a respect for nature and natural living, and a commitment to dialogue and communal reasoning. Life Yard draws heavily on black radical traditions, including the philosophies, as I said, of Garveyism and Rastafarianism. All of its mutual aid programs, from school breakfasts to urban farming, to its community tours and arts and crafts programs are guided by these principles. Similarly, another um, social economy in Jamaica, a social organization, must, the Mustard Seed Communities. This is a not-for-profit um, established by Monsignor Gregory Ramkissoon, a Catholic priest who in the 1970s, in 1978 to be specific, um, founded the Mustard Seed Communities. The Mustard Seed Communities is now an international NGO with branches in Latin America and in Africa. It continues to draw on its Christian missionary tradition to meet the needs of adults and children with a range of developmental and physical disabilities. While in the past, both of these organizations, Life Yard and the Mustard Seed Communities, relied heavily on charitable donations to fund their operations, they are increasingly being encouraged to become more proficient and attuned to the principles of enterprise. So my question is this, um, might the current efforts to orient social organizations towards the metric of the market sow the seeds of what one ILO document calls mission drift by which I mean a shift away from the emphasis, a shift away in emphasis from their main social mission. So my question here and what I want to talk about a little bit is the way in which the take up of the social enterprise model has entailed a slow drift away for the organizations that have become or have embraced it from their original social mission. And that's the question I ask, should we worry about this? Now, the findings of a 2017 British Council USAID FHI 360, this is a large international multinational, uh, a large international not-for-profit. They um, established a partnership project to map the size, the scale and potential of social enterprise in Jamaica. And their findings offer some indication of the challenges that abound when the vocabulary of entrepreneurialism, financial innovation, and profit become part of the mission of serving people over profit. The British Council USAID FIH360 Mapping Project surveyed 166 organizations in Jamaica, 126 of which were considered to be social enterprises because they had a declared social mission, because they derived 30% or more of their income from sources other than grants and donations, and because they reinvested their surpluses back into their organization. So that was the criteria that they used to 
differentiate or to delineate what was a social enterprise. And I want you to think about that, that, that their definition of social enterprise included the fact anyone or any institution or organization that derived more than 30% of its income from some other source than grants or donations or charity. So that means that 70% would be based on charities and grants, etc. Now of these social enterprise, of the ones in, included in this study, most of them are really very small, with 70% earning less than 5,000 US dollars per year and dependent on external funding from grants, 43%, in-kind contributions and donations. And that, so the slide that I have here gives you a, just a sense, many of them very heavily dependent on grant funding, many of them dependent on donations, um, in-kind resources, and these are the social enterprises. These are not the ones that weren't defined as such. Um, and much of that coming from um, communities. So the community actually is the source of the funds, um, state agencies and individual donors. This is a profile I would argue that is consistent with organizations led by a social mission I don't see that there is anything looking at these figures that suggests otherwise. But based on the survey, the impression was that these institutions fell short from the expectations for what should be a social enterprise. So let me rephrase that. So when we look at that survey, what is very clear is that most of the institutions that they surveyed were small, were dependent on external funds, they did not generate most of their income through enterprise, and they certainly, um, you know, were very, very reliant on their communities and funding agencies for funds. In the report, at the end of this report, it was recommended that Jamaican organizations, the ones that they surveyed, needed to have a much clearer sense of what was expected of them if they chose to present themselves as a social enterprise. And what they would need to do is to um, have a much stronger stated commitment to providing goods and services to earn revenue. They needed to adopt metrics such as cost benefit analyses and social returns on investment approaches so that their capacity to absorb resources effectively, and I'm quoting here, and deliver results could be clear. The report also argued that these institutions, not only would they need to demonstrate their capacity to absorb resources and to deliver results, but they would also need to allow external partners to validate any assessment of value creation that they claimed. These are the sorts of recommendations that replicate the conventions and procedures that govern for-profit businesses. And the fact that this is, has become part of the recommendations on a project surveying social enterprises speaks to the challenges that these organizations will face if they choose to continue or to become social enterprises. So in drawing attention to the way that market logics have begun to encroach upon the social and solidarity economy, which is what I think I've been sort of trying to convey, I don't mean to suggest that social institutions should eschew activities aimed at generating income. In fact, most not-for-profit organizations have engaged in income generation activities for some time in order to survive. In the case of LifeYard, while much of its initial success came from its online presence and global crowdfunding appeals, its income generating urban farm, vegan restaurant and juice bar, its community tourism product, projects, they have all been actually quite successful. Similarly, the mustard seed community has operated an income generating ceramics manufacturing unit for the last 25 years 
to supplement its highly successful fundraising work. And they raise on average about 500 to 600 million Jamaican dollars, which would be equivalent to three to 4 million US dollars or 250 to 300 rupees, million, 250 million to 300 million rupees each year to meet basic needs. So if we look at these institutions, they are already income generating even before they signed on to be recognized as social enterprises. But there's a difference, I think, between engaging in markets to enable and expand an organization's social mission and having markets govern the worth or value of an organization's social mission. And in the current policy landscape, the embrace of so the social enterprise model is increasingly shifting the balance of power towards markets rather than communities. As international development agencies embrace the social enterprise model, so too have social organizations. They've been forced to, like the mustard seed communities, which now has, its, has extended its income generating activities to include fish ponds, organic egg production, pig and vegetable farms, a bakery. It has future plans to build an abattoir, a honey farm, you know, in a sense, the more that funding streams become tied to becoming a social enterprise, is the more that social organizations that never, never used to be so tied towards the expectations or the, ex the demands of markets, they increasingly have to do so. And as the executive director of the Mustard Seeds community has argued, Sustainability has become a necessity, especially given the fact that the special needs of the population which we care for are greater than those of the average person. With frequent medical care, special education and therapy being some of the services required, the mustard seed communities have realized that income generation could provide a steady stream of revenue to fund some of our operations. So supported by a USAID and Jamaica National, which is the name of um, one of the banks in Jamaica, their foundation. So supported by a sort of joint project called the Social Enterprise Boost Initiative, the Mustard Seed community has significantly expanded its operations in ways that have been lauded as evidence of its progress towards the road to self-sufficiency. But I do question the extent to which that really is the case. It seems to me increasingly looking at the mustard seed community that it, it, it will be challenged to maintain its social vision even as it expands its um, economic mission. So it's not altogether clear whether other social enterprises, especially those that are new and small, youthful, and most importantly, not grounded in the histories of coloniality and dispossession can achieve the sort of success that Lifeyard and the mustard seed communities have been able to boast. Without a deeper grounding and connection to the long histories of struggling community, it's not really clear how some of the emerging social enterprises will survive beyond the seed monies that brought them to life. And especially now in the context of COVID-19. So I want to sort of end by saying that, you know, Doreen Massey and, and Michael Rustin remind us that economics is not simply a technical matter beyond politics. And for the same reason, economic policy should be more than just a set of individual policies addressing disparate is issues. Each policy should be an expression of a wider narrative an underlying political rationality and the interests and values which they implicitly articulate. So for me, the social enterprise model is a contradictory one because its efforts to make cooperatives, mutual aid societies, self-help groups more responsive to market metrics rely upon logics that are contradictory to the social mission of social and solidarity economies themselves founded on principles of respect, care, reciprocity, and solidarity, social economies utilize a vocabulary that speaks to identities, 
roles, and relationships among people, places, and institutions. And many of these are at odds with the neoliberal rationalities that currently hold dominance over the way that we understand what the economic world naturally should be. In the case of Jamaica, the social enterprise model of market governance misses fundamental philosophies and key political rationalities that have sustained solidarity economies for hundreds of years. These are crucial components that those who participate in them should see as vital to the reproduction of society. So ultimately, to question the social enterprise model is to question the place that markets should occupy in the making of societies. It's to question why market exchange has become imperative to all our social relationships and to resist the assumption that market goals are commensurate with social justice. To question the social enterprise model is also to assert that histories matter. And in the context of Jamaica, the long histories of struggle against racial dispossession matter to the, to the credibility of social organizations and the success of their social missions. And that's it. <laughs>